This is Under the Cover, where we take you behind the scenes of some of the most iconic photo shoots, music videos, and fashion shows of our time. I'm Kylie Cavaco Rec, and alongside my father, legendary stylist Paul Cavaco, we'll dive into the glamorous styles and the ingenious collaborations that shaped modern fashion. We'll talk to supermodels, designers, hairdressers, makeup artists, and even a few other stylists to hear their personal stories. Because there's always a story under the cover. It has been said that Cindy Crawford is an American icon. This is Cindy Crawford. Hi, Cindy Crawford. It's so funny when you have like a last name, like, like you know, it's like you're your whole name. <laughs> it's like you're reminds your whole me name. of when you describe people that you went to school with, you always have to say their first and last name. <laughs> yes, because there might be two Cindys in class. Yes, exactly. But well, in fact, one could just say Cindy and most people know that we're talking yes. about, in fact, Cindy Crawford. Yeah. It's true. You are the most famous of the Cindys. I, I don't know. There's a lopper. And actually, what's funny is people, I think they just know famous names. So people will come up to me and be like, are you Cindy Lauper? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you look so you much know. alike. Exactly. <laughs> Same height even. When you look into Cindy Crawford, the word icon is the most common word that comes up. Phew. I was really worried. I've never Googled <laughs> myself and I never will. Um, so I'll just take your word for it. Obviously, the way that I know of you is as a model and then a supermodel. Um, but you are an icon. You are um, somebody that your first name, like Prince or Madonna, um, is your moniker. People know you as Cindy. There was a podcast that you were on and they asked you, it was Mini Driver's podcast, and she asked you questions that were sort of like Proust questionnaire. Um, to get to know you better. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that I think is a, a common question in a questionnaire is, who would you like to have dinner with, dead or alive? And mm -hmm. I thought to myself after listening to that, I'd like to have dinner with Cindy Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my choice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when I was listening to the podcast, what we know about Cindy as a model is you're also spoken about as like the, the smart model or the intellectual <laughs> model. And... She brings up the fact that you went to Northwestern and you were, and you talk about your, that you take your mind everywhere you go. Oh, wow. That was a clever thing to say. <laughs> it was super clever. Well, and that's what you, when you're listening to the podcast, what you take away from that is Cindy is super clever. That is certainly true for everybody, right? And I think that modeling gave me the opportunity to take my mind a lot of places, right? That I never would have gotten to go, um, you know, literally traveled the world, being around tons of creative people, you know, even just asking people what books they're reading or, you know, before you jumped on, Paul and I were talking about TV shows we're watching. It's like connecting with other people who are different than you, but creative or maybe not creative. Maybe they're the business person or maybe they're the, um, you know, the financial person, um, asking questions. I think I, I do think I ask questions and I, I like people for the most part and until I don't, you know, just kidding. And, um, you know, it's just like being, being curious. I think, uh, it also makes my life more fun. Like I, there's, I'm very uncomfortable, like at a dinner where no one's talking. So I just fill the space. I just start asking questions. I just start interviewing people. Probably made you a very good host for House of Style. Well, that's probably where I learned it, actually. One of the one of the places that I learned it. You were always curious. And, you know, being in the studio with you was not, it was not dull. Let's <laughs> yeah, well, I liked to understand the assignment. I mean, I like to understand, you know, I think, one of the things that I really love about modeling is it's so collaborative at its best. And the, the only way that you can be collaborative is that everyone gets on the same page and you're sharing a vision and you're understanding like, what are we, what's the story we're trying to tell today? And what's my role in telling that story? So I think in terms of like, like Paul, how you and I work together, it's like, oh, we're doing a story that's like loosely based on Georgia O'Keeffe or whatever. And like, oh, I get that. And we all look at references. And then and then the fun part is like telling that story. I mean, I do think 
fashion photography and modeling is a form of storytelling, you know, through, through photographs as opposed to, you know, movies that tell stories in a different type of way. Well, I think the thing that's funny is I think people don't realize how big a collaboration it is that everyone that's involved has to be involved, like fully involved. You cannot check out. That's when it works the best. I mean, th there's times um, when you don't share the vision or you don't get the vision or there's times where, look, you're just selling a T-shirt or whatever. And that's the story. <laughs> that's the <laughs> you're story. selling that T-shirt. But at its best, it's so much more than that. Yeah. In the podcast that I'm referring to, you actually talk about doing a shoot with a duo. You don't say which duo, but you talk uh -huh. about doing a shoot with a duo, um, photographers, and that they, this pictures were sexy, but that you didn't want them to be coy and that mm -hmm. you were, um, and that was sort of like a disservice to women to be showing that, um, that, you know, you were an adult woman with an adult life, an adult experience, and that that's not what it was supposed to be. And that women, I think, have always looked at you as, um, as I think there are a lot of models that women sort of look up to or look to, but because I think so much of your platform was talking about how you began and very much, a, you know, you're an American icon. So a lot of women, I think, really wanted to be you. And I think you took that very seriously and honored that in women in such a beautiful way where you wanted to make sure that you weren't displaying something that women couldn't live up to or could not be or that they maybe shouldn't aspire to be. And I know that you two had a shoot that you did together <laughs> that um, sort of goes along the same lines. I know, this is, you were the first, uh, maybe only person I've ever <laughs> had like a moment with. And we didn't, you know, for the listening audience, we didn't have a big moment. We had, no. we were doing a shoot for Harper's Bazaar and the designers had done all these, all these big designers had done sweaters that season for some bizarre reason. <laughs> so I thought, oh, let's do, you know, a story on sweater girls and we'll do all the very sexy, beautiful mm -hmm. models. And it was you. Claudia. Claudia and Karen Muldor. So it's three very different type of women. The first who come in, they come all at separate times and it's with Patrick de and... Kevin O'Quan has decided that it was that moment also in the 90s where we were changing everyone. Like, you know, suddenly everyone's, if you had eyebrows, your eyebrows got bleached. If you were a blonde, you ended up brunette. If, you know, so we were changing everyone and that was the mode. And Kevin had decided he had just gotten, they were called Mark Trainers. And it was these two, they go on the side of your face <laughs> and under your chin and they pull your face up. It's tapes. Two, it's two tapes that have elastics that attach back here. And it's like a face oh, wow. lift. So everyone looked kind of like, you know. A it severe gave, version of themselves? A severe version, like cat eye. And, you know, so it was, I look at the pictures now and I think, oh my God, what were we thinking about? <laughs> because. You were being creative. We were being creative. And Kevin was, you know, and I think the thing is when you, as a team doing something, you just, go, you know, you, Try it, and if it's working, you go with it. If it doesn't work, you undo it. You came in, you were the last one, and we started to do it. And you said, I'm like 20-something. I think it's weird to look like I have a facelift. I think it's not a good, a good a message. message to give to young women. And, of course, you appealed to the fact that I had a daughter. So when we're talking about this idea of this shoot and the tapes that Kevin O'Quan was using – to alter um, what it sounds like we were also not wanting to alter was the brand of Cindy Crawford too. Although I don't know that we knew that yet. Did yeah, you know I that yet? I mean, honestly, first of all, I, I definitely will agree with Paul that it was like, it was like a moment for us, but I really appreciated the way that you dealt with me, Paul, because I, and this is my recollection, but you're kind of like, as an editor, I'm really annoyed with you because I think you're a model and you should just basically do what I say and do what the team wants. But you're like, but as a father of a daughter, I think you're making the right decision. And I appreciated that. Um, you know, these things that Kevin 
this is a case where not everyone was telling the same story, right? Like Kevin decided to use these weird tapes without us models signing on. And I think that's where um, you get into trouble. And I think the only time as a model where I've regretted something I've done was when I didn't sign up for it and I got talked into doing it. And there's several times where that happened in my career early on. And slowly you find your ability to say no. And I think I was exercising it that day. And fortunately for me, like Paul didn't excommunicate me and Patrick didn't excommunicate me. You know, they respected my position on that. Because we staggered the girls coming in, we didn't really think about it. And I think it was, for me, it became the first time that I had to think about the fact. We were so used to collaborating and always being on the same page, but it never seemed like an issue. And it was the first time something happened where I had to really think about it and take into consideration, this is going to sound horrifying, the humanity of the person Mm. that was actually in front of me. Because I think we always think of each other as friends, you know, because we spend a lot of time together. Absolutely. And, you know, we had done, in our case, we had done a lot of shows together. You did a lot of shows when Keisha and I were working, you know, and so... I felt I had a thing with you, you know, we had a a relationship. And so it was like, oh God, I'm having a moment with Cindy. So I've carried this, this is like how many (laughs) years ago, and I still think about it because it was so, it was such a significant moment, but it was a very, it changed something for me in a good way. Yeah. And for me too, because I, you know, I think as a young woman, when you learn to advocate for, advocate for yourself, and it's actually respected, that empowers you to do it the next time. And, you know, I wasn't thinking of myself as a brand then. I just didn't, it was like a gut check. It just didn't feel right to me. I was like, this is really messed up. Like we're like already fashion um, photographs are, you know, it's two hours of hair and makeup and perfect lighting and amazing styling and a great photographer and then retouching if needed. And we're, We already sometimes put out these unrealistic images for women to judge themselves by. And I was like, and now we're going to give facelifts to 26 year olds or however old I was. I'm like, that's just insane. Um, And also it hurt. I remember not liking the way it felt because it was really tight. And I was like, I'm going to be really uncomfortable too. So maybe there was a selfish part too, but I am glad I stuck up, stuck up for myself. And I do think it was like, um, in retrospect, it's one of those things I'm proud of that I was able to just say no. No, I, I think you were completely right. And I Thank think you. that was also sort of an early moment in collaboration where people, I think, at that point started to honor the woman that was in the photograph for a variety of reasons mm-hmm. and really look at also we've got to pay these women what they're worth. And we have to look at how we treat them. And um, I think that that was such a gentle way, actually, when you look at the whole world, like it's such Mm -hmm. a small way. And I think when people are paying attention to how they're interacting with each other, especially when you're working with friends, it's so nice to have like a gentle sort of gut check, as you say, or like something that just gives you like a, oh, wait a minute, there's a different way to do this or there's a different way to approach this. Also, I think the big difference was you were, I think, around 25 when this happened. Yeah, sounds about right. But the generation before you, by the time they were 25, had pretty much stopped. They were doing cigarette ads. They were no longer really doing editorial. You guys were the first one that went on. I mean, you're still modeling. Who would have ever thought? (laughs) But you modeled very strongly into your 30s, like as a daily thing. Yes. Not as, you know, which had not never happened. So it's the first time that you guys, that models were really old enough to really advocate for themselves, I think. They were women by then, not, you know, young. But I think also what you're talking about too is the longevity that, I mean, everyone in that generation of every type of creative has had a really long career. So whether it be hair and makeup or editors, or models, because there was, I think, such a collaborative nature and so much fun and friendship that was created, then 
even when people may have left the business for whatever reason, it was like, oh, we're doing a shoot with Cindy or we're doing a shoot with Paul. Would you come and do the shoot? Or, you know, we've got, you know, Orbe's doing the hair and you go, oh, I want to be, I want to be back with Orbe in the studio. And so it made people also elongate their career because they wanted to collaborate with people because they knew the photo would be great if that person was on set. So yeah. And it was just fun. It was like high school reunion or whatever. Like whenever I get an (laughs) opportunity to, um, you know, like just recently doing um, Edward's final British Vogue cover with, you know, 40 women and like so many, I mean, they were, you know, everywhere from Jane Fonda to my daughter. So it, but, you know, certainly my group of, you know, Christy and Linda and Naomi and Kate, uh, there were so, uh, Amber, um, there were so many of us together. I mean, that's just like, it's fun. It's it's truly like a, a, a reunion of, of sorts. So I always like doing that. So I think when you think about advocating for women and talking about women and aging, then you end up creating this incredible, incredible beauty line, which I think is um, my favorite story about this beauty line actually is I was sitting next to somebody at a party in a dinner party and I, like you, feel very uncomfortable at a dinner party. And this gentleman turned to me and said, can we talk about Cindy Crawford's melons? And I said, oh, sorry, excuse me. I had no idea what that meant. And at the time then learned that the hero ingredient in your serum is in fact a melon, Um, but did not know that at the time. And he told me this wild sort of story of how inspired he was by you and Dr. Sabah and making this brand and how, you know, there was an injection into a, a melon. And he's telling me this whole story. And I thought to myself, how fascinating that whatever science they've harnessed is so captivating that this man is like telling a strange woman all about this skincare. I, of course, was riveted because I was really into skincare. So I'm listening to this man talk. And I said, where did you learn all this? And he said, I'm thinking he must have insomnia and watching the infomercial at two in the morning. That's That would be my guess. Um, but you, you are know, correct. The thing about Meaningful Beauty that's really cool is that, so we're turning 20 this year, this is our 20th anniversary. And much like I didn't think I would still be in front of a camera at 58, I certainly, when I started Meaningful Beauty, I thought, you know, maybe five years or something like that. But why it was such an important part of my career was I was 35 and my Revlon contract, which I'd been with Revlon for 17 years, my Revlon contract was up and we were in negotiations to renew. And I just was like, this is my time to do my own thing. If I'm going to do my own thing, I felt it was now. And I also felt like I didn't want to do cosmetics because the truth of the matter is I don't really wear makeup that much in real life. If I need makeup, there's usually a makeup artist putting it on me. Um, But my job as a model was really about taking care of my skin. And through my access of being Cindy Crawford, I had met this doctor in Paris, actually through Fran Cooper, a makeup artist friend of mine and Paul's. Um, when I was 28 years old, Fran Cooper, she and I were in Paris and she's like, I want to take you to this doctor. And I was like, why? I'm 28. And she's like, no, he does this mesotherapy treatment, like a vitamin for your skin. I think you love it. And I, it was love at first sight with um, Dr. Sabah and his treatments. And it used this special super antioxidant from a melon called SOD. And So I would go to Paris. I was in Paris all the time. So every time I was in Paris, I would just go have a treatment. But eventually I got married. I moved to LA. I had kids. And and, and then it was that Revlon expired. And I was just like, do you want to do a skincare line with me? And he was like, well, it has to be meaningful. And I said, I agree. And that's so meaningful beauty was just like our working title, but it stuck. And that was how we measured like the efficacy of each and every product that it had to be meaningful. It couldn't just be like, oh, it feels great. It's like, it has to feel great. And it has to be doing something, you know, short-term results as well as long-term results. And so that was how Meaningful Beauty was born. And, you know, even that whole process of really, because I had done other things, you know, that were not, you know, the, the typical, like I had done House of Style, I had done Playboy, which was not, you know, what most of the models talk about that. (laughs) Okay. Um, I had done, 
an exercise video that was very successful that also like I produced. So I, I, you know, had little forays into doing my own projects, but leaving a very lucrative cosmetic contract to do a skincare line was a big um, gamble on my part, but I was ready for it. And I, I wanted equity. Like I wanted, if it was successful, that I would be successful. I was ready to take a chance on myself. So I think that was a big, a big step for me as like a, I guess, as a businesswoman. And, you know, the way I decided to do an infomercial with Guthy Ranker was, you know, I met with everyone from like, you know, high end department store to drug stores. And then also Guthy Ranker, who was my partner, infomercial. But, you know, there's so much competition in skincare. And I thought, how are we going to compete with these huge brands that have huge budgets? But when you do an infomercial, you have 30 minutes to tell your story. And I felt like we had a very honest and compelling and authentic story. And that's why I chose infomercial. And also they let me be a full partner. So it was like, if, if it's successful, we all do great. If it's not successful, then we all suffer the same. And I, I guess I was ready for that kind of challenge you know, at that point in my career. When you think about a modeling career, right? The pinnacle of a modeling career for many people is a contract. So it's interesting that now a lot of people would say like the pinnacle of their modeling or their celebrity even is a brand, having a brand. So you were very early to that. I mean, now that we're going on 20 years of meaningful beauty and this idea of taking that risk and betting on yourself is sort of what, I mean, as a mom, that's what I would say to my children is you can always bet on yourself and such a great message to put out, but n no one, maybe my dad actually would tell me to bet on myself. So I should say that, but you know, it's like, I, I didn't grow up with my mom died when I was 13. So I didn't have that person as a mom who was like, just, you know, trust yourself, trust yourself and just do. My dad was more like, it'll be okay. It's all going to be okay. It all works out. And I feel like when I did research on you, it sounds like your mom was really always quite supportive of you and always was um, a part of, you know, part of your support system that also made you feel like you could be a great mom. But was she supportive or was she part of your ability to say like, I can bet on myself, I can do this? Or was that more business? The one gift my mother gave me in that arena is that she kind of was like, what's the worst thing that can happen is you fail. She made failure seem not so terrible, but you know, she wasn't able to advise me in business. And you know, one of the things that you're saying, like, I, yes, I would tell my kids to bet on themselves too. And I do think some of the young generation though, they just want to start their own business at 18 Yes. I was 35. I had worked with a lot of different companies. I had asked a lot of questions. I understood what worked and didn't work. Then I felt comfortable starting my own business. Like I, I think I see a lot of people that, you know, you get, you, you gain so much, even if it's a crappy job, working mm -hmm. for other people, learning yes. maybe what you don't like. But, um, you know, i I, I, there's no way I could have done meaningful beauty at 21 or even Agreed. 25. You know, I, I, I had done enough and started small with my own little projects. And then when I finally was like, okay, I'm really taking a chance here. And also financially, I could, you know, I had some stability. So it wouldn't have been like a total disaster if it, if it crumbled. Yeah. I was 39 when I started my business. I wasn't a yeah. child either. And I had had lots of jobs and lots of horrendous bosses. I hope they listen to this podcast. You know, so I agree with you, the, the failures, the experiences, the asking a lot of questions, getting a lot of answers and being able to begin from a place of knowledge around business or around whatever you're endeavoring to do. And also understanding failure as part of that too, because that is inevitably part of it. And we're either, as I like to say, we're either winning or we're learning. Um, and, you know, it's not always a win. But how did your mom feel when you did Playboy? Oh, I, I wasn't actually worried at all what my mom thought about Playboy. I was more worried about my dad thought. And um, 
I just remember calling him. I mean, I didn't ask permission or anything like that, but, and, and it's a weird the way it happened because I was shooting with Herberts for French Vogue and we tacked Playboy on it. And like, we were shooting the same, like some pictures were for Playboy and some were for French Vogue. Like you couldn't even really tell the difference. Um, so what I remember saying to my, my dad, look, I did Playboy, but just wait judgment until you see them because you know t- to me they were much more elevated than what like a typical playboy image looked like and um but still i think it was probably i knew my dad was gonna you know he was an electrician i mean i'm sure he got some ribbing from the guys at work about his daughter being a playboy but i think by the time i made that decision i was so comfortable with it that it really it really didn't matter like I I was comfortable with my decision and really it was against pretty much like my agents and everyone were telling me not how did that go because that seems to me that was I think everything you've done your career has been brave that was definitely risky on the cover of Vogue and Playboy like within one month of each other and I do think my agency at the time was like you know this we don't know about this I did build in some safeguards. Like I, my deal, I didn't take, I hardly got paid anything. The first time I did Playboy, I said, I'd rather not take money and I'd rather have photo approval and the ability to kill it if I'm not happy with it. And, you know, Herb Ritz, who was a dear friend, shot it. I remember going to his house. We edited the pictures together. And, you know, in the end, doing Playboy, you know, so many things like accordion into each other because doing Playboy... All of a sudden, I had a whole new audience that wasn't women that read fashion magazines. Because of Playboy, I got MTV because when I did House of Style, they were looking for someone that appealed to men and women. Pepsi also was like that too, right? Like it's it's not like a super, you know, highbrow fashion brand, right? Pepsi, but neither was Revlon really. Like my, I feel like where my sweet spot was in the fashion industry was not those super exclusive, you know, high fashion brands. I mean, yes, I did Versace and things like that, but my bread and butter was Revlon, Pepsi, you know, Omega. All American brands. But you did everything. That was the interesting thing about your career was you were doing high fashion. You were on the cover of Vogue. And I was telling Kylie this, the original thought about models on the cover of Vogue was blonde, blue-eyed, because it reflects light. And so when you see it on the newsstand, the eye, you can see the eye because it's light. And you were on many, many times on the American Vogue cover. You Because when people saw you on the cover, they bought the issue. So you actually sold. Well, that's, and that's the thing, like, you know, all these things about like, oh, you have to send thank you notes or you have to kiss people's, you know, bums to get covers. No, you will get another cover if you sell and you won't get another cover if you don't sell. It's that simple. So it's like, yes, you want to be friendly with the people you work, but it's it's a business. And I think that when I first started doing bow covers with Richard Avedon, he was great because he shot with those big, like a large format camera. And it's, it's, that's not like the most fun way to shoot. Like I much prefer like a faster camera where they're like, click, 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 click. And you're, no, you're moving and the fan's going. With Avedon, it was like, he's under the thing. It's like, Shh. then they have to take it out. It's a, it's a very slow. So to, to get like that spark, that thing in front of a camera is, it's, it's harder. But I remember he told me, just have a thought in your eyes. And he goes, even if it's by me, I'm $3. <laughs> and um, I swear I use that so many times. So it must have worked. <laughs> I've heard you say that, but I didn't know it actually f- was from Richard Avedon. Yeah. I love knowing that. Yeah. But you, you got the first book cover very early in yes. your career. Yes. I mean, I was 20 but I had just moved to New York. I came, my first shoot for Vogue was with um, Wayne Mazur and Carlene Surf in St. Bart's. It was a swimsuit story. <laughs> that was interesting. Um, <laughs> but the pictures were great. And because of that, they booked me for a cover try with Polly Mellon and Avedon. And from my very first shoot with Avedon, I got two covers from, I got like a August and October from that first. And then 
I did many covers with Avon on and then later when Anna came in and she switched to Stephen and Patrick. I, you know, or was did Patrick do American Folk? No, her yeah, no. Stephen. No, pa- You're right. Patrick did yeah. too. So, you know, had had the opportunity of doing I, you know, I love those Avidon, like just big head covers. But then, you know, when Anna kind of reinvented Vogue to to look more approachable, maybe, I don't know what, um, but I, you know, definitely had a lot of those covers as well. But I found it interesting because you did Vogue. You were a Vogue cover girl. Mm-hmm. You did inside pictures of Vogue. You worked with Helmut Newton. Yeah. Penn. Yes. Avidon. Stephen, you know, you worked with every, every big photographer Mm -hmm. and you did Playboy, which is not the, you know, it's really, then you did House of Style. Mm -hmm. It was not, the trajectory was different. Right. And yet it never affected anything. It never. Or maybe it affected everything positively. Positively. I think people thought it would affect, doing Playboy would affect it negatively. And if somehow you as a human, I don't know if this is the truth, but I was an icon. You, who you were actually kind of superseded any thing that was going to happen. You still were always intact as you. And I think people responded to you as a human, even though you were like a visual. (laughs) And I do think that, was the era of, and you know, we just did the documentary with Naomi and Christy and Linda and and like I talked about in there, like, you know, we were almost like cast as like a boy, if you were casting a boy band, but like as like the four of us um, together, because we all look different, but we look good together. We all kind of had our own personality. And I think that was the time when, um, you know, ev- the, so much focus was on fashion and the designers and, and we were allowed, and I do really credit Gianni Versace with this, with letting us, like he wanted us to be big because the bigger we were, the bigger his show was, or the bigger the campaign was. So it was a time when our personalities were um, celebrated as opposed to like, now I look at runway shows and like, you know, it's like, it's almost like they want everyone to look exactly the same, strip their personality out. Like no one's allowed to smile. Everyone has to have the same walk. Like we had fun doing shows. We were able to bring our personality to a show. And people wanted to watch the show because they wanted to see you all in the clothes. You know, that was, and I think probably why there was a shift was probably because people were like, no, no, let's look at the clothes. Let's stop looking at the girls. Let's look at the clothes. But what was amazing about that time period I mean, that's when I would go to shows with you all the time. And and then when I was an editor, I think it was like you got to see all of you in real life, in the clothes, and it was exciting. And it actually, you could probably remember the look even a little bit better, honestly, because instead of being like look seven, it was like Cindy's look or Christy's look. You actually had, so I do think it was actually sort of a mistake to go that way, to go into the, you know, no name, no face, no personality, because I do think it actually does lift it and support it. Like the rising tide lifts all boats. But I do think that that's why that reaction happened initially. You all were so big. Also, I think the thing is you were interested to go to the show knowing that they were going to be there, but knowing how they were going to look different each time. And I think that allowed people to see, oh, if you know, if I do this with my hair, I can look this way. If I do this with my makeup, I can look this way. If I wear this clothes, you know, this type of clothing. I think it gave them the idea that you didn't have to be just one thing. You could be many. Fa- there was a many, chameleon aspect. There was to a it. many facet, you know, because you didn't, you still remained who you are, but you could still. You Cindy know. in particular always remained who she is. And I think that, I think sometimes maybe that must have been a lot of. Uh, I'm from, I mean, I, no one's concerned about when I show up somewhere, if I have to be myself, but the idea of even sometimes when you're just in an experience and someone expects you to be that person, very on, very delivering Cindy Crawford. I wonder what it must be like to think about, cause Cindy Crawford is a person as you, and it's also, it, Cindy Crawford is a thing almost. Mm-hmm. I always say we all work for Cindy Crawford. Anyone on my team, I'm like, okay, <laughs> uh, including me. But um, I, I honestly, I, th- I do think it's easier to carry that burden when the image that you're projecting is pretty 
authentic. Like, you know, I'm not like privately one way and publicly another way. Yeah, maybe I'll wear a higher heel if I'm being Cindy Crawford or my hair will be a little more pulled together or whatever, but I don't have, you know, it's not like two different things. One's maybe just a slightly more pulled together version of the other one. You've, you've always, and I've known you now a long time. I just say more only, than 20 years, Paul. I never say more than yes. that. I'm like, we go, <laughs> we've known each other so long, more than 20 years. And I knew you young when you yes. first came. You're still always the same person. Oh, well. You know, and which is, I mean. You too. So nice. You too. Yeah, but you grew, but I was already a grown up when you met me. You mm-hmm. grew up. I watched you grow up and you, you stayed consistent. Okay. You know, you changed, you matured, which is a different thing than changing. Yeah. I think you just, mm. you were still always, everything that I love about you has stayed exactly the same. It isn't like, oh, you know, when I met her, she was this way and now she's this way. Mm-hmm. You were always exactly who you are, which, you know, I think is a wonderful attribute. I read this thing that said people keep falling in love with Cindy Crawford. I thought was so cute. I do think like growing up in the Midwest and having, you know, the family that I had that there's so much a part of who I am. And also like I did finish high school. I did go to college. I, I didn't move to New York. Like it didn't hit for me really. Like when I came to New York, I was 20. That's a big difference from like the girls that come when they're 15 or 16. So by the time I got to New York, which everyone was like, she's so old. Like, like they didn't send me to Europe for two years because they were like, oh, she's too old. Like they, they, they were like, we got to get her in front of everyone right away. She's already 20. Um, that was ancient. But I do think that because of having, and I was, was working in Chicago with Victor Skrbneski and other photographers there, but I did have an opportunity to kind of adult before I came to New York. And I, and that's probably, even though, yes, I was much younger, I was still 20. I wasn't 15. I mean, I remember meeting Christy when she was like 15, you know, (laughs) we always laugh about that. It's very different. 20 to 15 is I have a 16 year old daughter. It's a very big difference. And you're, you're more who you are as a human being, but you know, that's, those are a lot of, those are big years that 15 to 20. Yes. You've been on a lot of covers, but when you were on the cover of George, were you on mm-hmm. the cover of George as George Washington or were you on the cover of George as Cindy Crawford as George Washington? I was on the cover of George. I was on the first cover of George. And I remember getting that call from John Kennedy Jr. And I was like, duh. Yeah, of course I'm going to do this. <laughs> uh, and it was her Brit shooting it. And again, I had a really close personal relationship with her, but also... Um, you know, I, there's so many photographers and Paul mentioned a lot of the ones that I've adored, like Helmet and Patrick and, you know, that I feel like got me. And, but if I had to pick one photographer of my career that like, I think really saw me and saw me in a lot of different ways, it would be Herb. And I just totally trusted him. So even when he was shoving a sock down my pants to be George Washington, I'm like, okay, you know, and they're putting a wig on me. Um, you know, but, and that was like, again, you know, her got me to take a lot of chances. Playboy, Katie Lang Vanity Fair cover, Which George, I, too. I mean, but when you are with a team that you trust, um, it's, you're willing to do, you know, you're willing to take those chances. I didn't even feel like they were really that big of chances. It's just like, I didn't particularly feel like sexy Cindy Crawford in a George Washington wig. Were you booked to be, did you know you were going to be George Washington when you showed up? You did. So it was, that was the pitch. Will you come on and be George Washington? I, I remember when that cover came out and I used to get my nails done, um, with Carolyn and she sat next to me and she said, I have a scoop for you. And I thought, (laughs) oh, great. Tell me. And she was like, Cindy Crawford's going to be on the cover of George. And I said, Oh, and this is like before, no one had a cell phone then. Mm. And she had a Polaroid. Oh my gosh. And I was like, it was this little, and you could tell it was you as Mm -hmm. Cindy Crawford, as, as George Washington. Yeah. That is an amazing cover. And she was so proud of that, which I thought Mm. was so cool. Cause it was like fashion, her world meeting his world, Yes, which was so cool. 
And, um, and she was like, I just wanted to tell you. It was so cute. <laughs> and I remembered being, I remember thinking like, I have something, I, I know a secret. Cause always, you know, my dad would shoot a cover and I would know who the cover was going to be. Cause obviously right. he was in studio with the person. And it was the first time that was the very first cover I'd ever been leaked to that someone had leaked me who the cover was. And she didn't tell me. Trustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> It's Thank the first you time so I much the story. for coming on here with us. Oh, no, it was fun. Like telling it. us your stories. I was saying to your dad before you got on, like I had lunch yesterday with Yasmin Laban and or on Monday and just like, you know, I haven't seen her in person probably in 10 years, but like we all have so much shared history that it's just, you know, I love it. It's just fun revisiting because I think, you know, I'm lucky and I, and I think, you know, all lucky that we we've, we've had great careers and you know, I mostly have nothing but fond memories for this business. It's, you know, it, it just opened up the whole world for me and gave me so many opportunities. So it's fun to, it's I fun to like, visit. It's funny. I feel exactly the same way. I'm so grateful to have been in this business and yeah. to have met everyone I met. Like people say, isn't it a terrible industry? I think I had no, I know. so much fun. It was like, it's a great industry. I know. You know? I know. I know. And it's like everything, like sometimes like the, you know, the few loud voices or, you know, one or two bad apples gives the whole industry a bad reputation. But, you know, I, I know for my daughter, you know, obviously, like I wouldn't have wanted my daughter to go into something if I thought anything other than it's like an amazing opportunity. And, you know, especially at a certain level, like you're just working with such talent and and really nice people too. Like I, some of my best best friends are from are from this industry. Me too. Yeah. Actually, almost all my best friends yeah. are from this industry for the most part. Yeah. You know? That's how I grew up. So that to me, it, to me, it's I have enormous fondness for the industry, and actually, I think so much reverence for the industry. It's why I probably couldn't even go into it myself. Mm. I couldn't even. I think beauty was a sort of especially then an adjacency to it. It wasn't really like a part of the fashion industry, but yeah. it was, I felt like I'll never be able to contribute to this industry on the level that I have seen. And to be able to be collaborating with these people, I would have felt like I was not, I, I wouldn't have felt like I had a seat at the table. I think and we all felt that in the beginning though. <laughs> I, I, I did for sure. I'm anyway. still not I, sure. I, I'm still I, yeah. not sure I was seated at the table. Exactly. I'm like, Shh, don't tell anybody that I don't belong here. But um, no, it was. It's been a great ride. Under the Cover is a production of Knockout Beauty Media Group and Audley. I'm writer and host Kylie Cavaco Rec. Guest booking is by Paul Cavaco and Lindsay Hannon. Audio and video production is by David Woji. Photo research is by Kate Hill. Our executive producers are Kylie Cavaco Rec and Paul Cavaco at Knockout Beauty Media Group, and Matthew Wells, Lindsay Hannon, and David Woji at Audley. Special thanks to Meredith Honig, Jessica Alpert, and John Parati at Rococo Punch, and Rachna Shah, Jamie Karp, and Jenna Preventure at KCD. For photos and more details on the series, follow Under the Cover Podcast on Instagram and Substack at Under the Cover. If you like the series, please leave us a review. And as always, don't forget to tell a friend. I'm Kylie Kavako-Rec. Thank you for listening.